starting now. Hi, everybody. It's Danielle Damiana with Wind Down Wednesday, and I am here with Kelsey Deneen with Midland Trust, and we are going to talk to you a little bit about 1031 exchanges. So, Kelsey, thank you so much for being on this with me. I get a lot of questions all the time about 1031s, what they are, and things like that, and I know you're an expert. So, um, let's tell everybody a little bit about what a 1031 exchange is. Sure, sure. So 1031 exchanges are incredibly popular. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever gone through the contracts that we usually use, like the as is standard contracts. But if you scan the language, 1031 language is already built in just because it's oh, wow. such a popular tool. Yeah, it's, it's that popular that they just put it right there in most as is contracts. So uh, the way it works, essentially, <clears throat> a 1031 is a tax tool. And it's really popular for uh, real estate investors. So uh, 1031 is actually a section of tax code, uh, section 1031, and it's a really cool tool that basically allows you to defer the tax bill when you sell an investment property. So I don't think most people think of it. Most people are just so happy to get a great rate of return on their rental or capital gains, you know, but basically when you sell an investment property, there's a lot of taxes that come due usually. Things like capital gains tax, uh, depreciation or capture tax, if you depreciated the property, which a lot of people do, just to kind of give them a tax benefit every year. Um, state taxes. And then uh, to fund Obamacare, they actually put in a 3.8% Obamacare help uh, tax as well. Oh so my gosh, wow. There's all sorts of things. I mean, really your CPA is the one to tell you exactly what the tax bill will be, but the 1031 is crazy popular because it basically helps your client defer the taxes. So if I sell a property and I'm doing a 1031 exchange, I don't have to worry about that tax bill. You know, it leaves more money in my pocket that I can turn around. And by law, you have to reinvest it in more property. So a lot of realtors see it as a great tool that not only helps their client because it defers taxes, but it also gives them repeat business because clients have to, by law, reinvest that money in more real estate in order to defer the tax bill. So it's really popular. That's a really good point. And actually that brings up my next question. So if you sell an investment property and you want to do a 1031 exchange, do you have to buy another investment property or can it be a second home, a primary residence? Great question. So 1031s only work for investment or business use property. Okay. okay. So it's not going to work for a primary home or a secondary home. Um, vacation homes will on a case by case uh, basis qualify as long as the person uses that vacation home a minimal amount. It's usually two weeks or 10% of the time rented. That's the, the rule of thumb for vacation homes. So it doesn't matter what type of property. It could be a single family home. It could be a condo. It could be anything. The key is what do you use it for? Is it your primary home or a secondary home? It's not going to work for a 1031 exchange. But okay. if it's an investment property, a business property, anything like that, then you can use it for 1031 exchanges. Okay. And then I've heard the term before, like kind. Mm -hmm. So what does that specifically mean? If you, let's just say, sell a $500,000 property, do you have to find another one 500 above or can you put it into a 200? How does that work? Great question. So like kind goes back to that. It has to be business use or investment use. They okay. don't care if you're selling a single family home and buying a single family home. A lot of people assume like kind means that it doesn't. It just means you're holding it for investment or business use. So I could sell a single family home and roll it into, you know, a condo. I could sell a commercial property and roll it into single family homes, whatever you want. They don't care about the property type. The kind part is investment or business use. And to answer your question of, as far as, you know, dollar amount, if you're selling for 500,000, the government says you have to spend what's called the net sales price. So 500,000 is your sales price minus closing costs, things like realtor commissions, doc stamps, things like that. That's what you have to spend on the new property. Okay. And they're actually, they're super flexible. You could buy one property that's around 500,000, or you could split it up and buy, let's say two properties for 250,000 each. So split it up oh, however you want just spend that net selling price. That's really good to know. Okay, perfect. So how long does the whole process take? Like, let's just say from start to finish with the 1031, especially if somebody is getting a mortgage. I'm actually doing a loan right now for someone that is in the middle of a 1031 um, and is using that proceeds, you know, to put down on the purchase. So how long does the process take um, from start to finish? 
Sure. So the nice thing about a 1031 exchange is the clock does not start ticking until you actually close on the sale of your old property. So a lot of people, when they think of 1031s, they think of the two key deadlines you have in a 1031. The first one is 45 days, and that's what they call your identification period. So when I sell, that's when my clock starts ticking. I have 45 days to identify what I might purchase. So it could be that one property we talked about. It could be two properties. They let you identify three properties of any value. And all identify means is I give you a piece of paper. I'm, I'm your qualified intermediary. That's what Midland does. I give you a piece of paper and I say, okay, we're officially in your identification period. List three potential properties. You don't have to be under contract. You don't have to do anything special. You just need to go out and basically find three properties that you're interested in that you want to identify. And you can change those all the way up to day 45. So you're locked in as of day 45. You can no longer change them. You then have 180 days total. So that's from the date you close on your sale of your old property. So I sell my old property, 45 days, I have to finish my identifications. 180 days total later, I have to actually buy one of those properties to complete my exchange. So those okay. are the two deadlines. Now, that being said, those deadlines usually make people pretty nervous because like 45 days after I sell is not a lot of time to figure out what I'm going to buy. So what I tell realtors is if you know your client's going to sell an investment or business property and they want to do this to defer the taxes, go out now before you even close on the sale. Start looking for things now that they might like because you can even go under contract before you've even sold the old property and lock that new property in to take some of that nervousness out of it, right? Like I wanna go out as a realtor, I wanna find what you want now, let's get it under contract. And in a perfect world, what I love to see as your qualified intermediary is I love to see you're under contract for your sale, your sale closes this month, and you're already under contract and ready to close on your replacement property next month, that's great. So no clocks start ticking, you can go under contract, you can make offers, don't worry about it until you actually close on your sale, that's when the clock starts ticking. Okay, so this brings me to my next point, which is, let's say somebody closes on their property. Um, and at the time, they don't think about doing a 1031 exchange. Now we're, you know, two weeks, three weeks from the sale. So you're still in that 45 day period. Are mm -hmm. they able to now go and do the 1031 exchange? Or do they have to know when they're selling their investment property and basically the proceeds go to you? I get this question all the time. So to answer it, you have to have the 1031 set up prior to closing, okay? okay? Even if you've signed the closing documents and you have that check, you just left the title company or attorney's office, it's too late. So okay. we like to be involved as soon as you're under contract for the sale of your old property. So as soon as you sign that contract, you found your buyer, call Midland, send me over that contract. We're gonna set up your exchange. We actually contact the title company or attorney who's doing your closing for the sale. And we have them update the closing documents to reflect you're doing a 1031 exchange. The big thing is the money. It cannot go to the client personally. If they okay. touch it, it's fully taxable. What has to happen is before closing, we set up the exchange. And then at closing, those sales proceeds are wired to your qualified intermediary. We park that money for you. So very important that all this is handled prior to closing. After closing, it's too late. You have to set it up before you close on your sale. Okay. And then that tax, so last and final question. Um, so that tax, let's say you continue to do a 1031, you know, year after year after year. Mm -hmm. So now that tax is getting deferred, right? And yes. now it's, you know, 30, 40 years later. Now you're paying taxes on that money right? You're not, how does that work? Sure. So ta this is tax deferral. So we call it kicking the can. Instead of paying the taxes now when I sell the property, the benefit of doing a 1031 is the government lets me hold on to that money that I would have given them in taxes and reinvest it in more property. Okay. So this is a great tool for people whose goal is to keep reinvesting and keep it going. Because if I do a 1031, it's almost like an interest-free loan from the government. If I would have given you 25,000 in taxes, I get to hold on to that money with no interest. It's basically free. It's a free loan from the government, you can almost think, and reinvest it. And I can do exchange over exchange over exchange. So 40 years later, I might have deferred, you know, who knows, millions of dollars in taxes, and I've got to hold on to that money and keep reinvesting it. Otherwise, I would have just given it away to the government in taxes years ago and helped it really grow my portfolio. 
So some people are kind of the Debbie Downers and say, well, you eventually have to pay it, right? You know, one day in the future. Well, not if you plan accordingly. So there's ways of accessing that equity without paying the taxes. So for example, one strategy some folks will come up with their CPA or financial advisor is they'll say, okay, well, maybe I keep exchanging. I build up my equity in these properties because I'm never paying taxes. I just keep on reinvesting it. And as I build up that equity in my portfolio, after my exchange is over, I could always look at refinancing and pulling some of that equity out of the property so I can touch that money and use it now. Mm -hmm. Refinances aren't taxable, right? It's not a sale. Right. So that's one strategy. Um, another strategy some people will use is, you know what? Maybe I just want to use this as a wealth planning te technique. So I do exchange after exchange my entire life. Right now, the government does not limit you on how much you can exchange, how much you can defer. It's a really awesome tool. And then what happens is when I pass away, eventually my heirs will inherit those properties at today's value. Your CPA will call it the stepped up basis. So when my, when my heirs inherit those properties at today's value, that tax bill has basically passed along with me. My heirs get it at today's value. That's a huge benefit. That wow. millions of dollars of tax that I've deferred has disappeared. That bill has died with me. And my heirs could basically turn around and sell the properties the day after my death for the current fair market values. And their gain is zero. They inherited it yesterday at today's, you know, today's cost. They've sold it today, uh, the next day at today's value. I haven't made any money as far as the government's concerned. So wow. it's a huge estate planning tool that a lot of folks like to use as well. Yeah, such a good point. Well, I know a lot of people have interest in 1031 exchanges, so I really appreciate you coming on and talking to everybody. Now, are you only in Florida or can you do this nationwide? We can do it nationwide. So 1031 exchanges, the, the 1031 tax code is a federal code. So I, I'm located in Fort Myers, Florida, but I can do exchanges in you know, any, any state uh, in the US. Uh, we even have some folks who, if they own international property, they're doing exchanges international for international. So we operate all over the world. That is amazing. Well, thank you so much for being on. I hope this gave everybody a lot of insight as to what 1031 exchanges are. And um, if anybody has any questions, Kelsey's information will be in this video. So thank you once again, and I will talk to you later. Bye.